I am his church. I am the church. And we covered a lot since two weeks ago, right? We covered that what church means. Actually, who the church, right? Not what the church, who the church. And we give a lot of statistics that how people regard negatively about the church. And I'm not talking about just people that are outside. There's a little bit of echo on this uh, thing back in the production team. There is an echo. Okay. So it's not about only the people that are outside church that they have a, a preconceived negative idea about the church. Even people that are in the church does not have the deeper understanding of the church, right? We talked about that. And we said, for some, a church is a possession, not an identity. I've been here for more than 20 years now, and that's the sad truth, right? For some, church is a possession, mine. For some, church is a profession, not a body not a body of Christ. But we say that, we discuss that, that is because we focus on what the church instead of who the church. And we say every and each individual of you guys are the church. Right? And we explained a lot of things. And one of the main things, I don't know, I don't put it here, but the main thing that we are regarding is church the building is the manifestation of church the person in church the person is a manifestation of church the building right we explained this briefly in detail the past two weeks um, after we explained that we've seen that the first story that we see in the first week is when Christ gave authority to St. Peter said I will build the, the church upon you and because why did he do that because St. Peter says testifies boldly you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Christ said, the flesh and the spirit, the body and flesh didn't reveal this to you. This my Father revealed it to you. And we saw some ideas saying, one, boldly testifying, not in just word, but in our life. If, you, if we are doing that, we are a church. Individually, we are a church. And second, if we focus on what God our Father revealed to us in the state of our fleshly, uh, what the flesh and blood come first to us. Remember, we talked about this. St. Paul, when God calls him out, Christ, he revealed himself and he said, change your life. And he, what did he say, St. Paul? He said, when that happened, that operation happened, I didn't confer with my flesh and blood. I just start serving God. And we say that sometimes, conferring with our flesh and blood, sitting down, reasoning of what God is telling us, that's the trick of the devil so that we can just delay of the calling of God we've discussed about that and lastly we discussed who revealed it to us who revealed it to us the Holy Spirit um, finally what we said is the gates of Hades shall not prevail against us the gates of Hades shall not prevail against us we may lose a battle but we will win the war remember yeah, you could fall to temptations. But at the end of the day, if we still stick to the Word of God, stick to the spiritual chores of prayer, scripture reading, and all of those things, at the end of the time, we will prevail. Prevail, we say it, prevail is not pre-struggle. What, what I mean by that is, you don't be a champion without the struggle. Before the struggle, if you don't, before you overcome the struggle, there is no prevailing. You need to struggle. You need to went through temptation so that you would prevail. And finally, we say the first week, because of that, you, the church, you're not a block of time that you could come from 6 to 8, from 10 to 12, that's church. No. 24-7, you are the church. And we say it, you're not something that starts and ends. And 
you are alive throughout the week, throughout the time. And we said, you're not a specific church, it's not a specific race, ethnicity, gender, ab age, ability. But what, one thing we say the first week, things that we perceive in Christ, we need to be able to manifest it throughout our life, right? We explain to the perceptions what we smell in church, what we see in church, what we chant in church. In all our five perceptions, what we do in the church needs to be manifested throughout our lives. That's the first thing that we covered the first week. Second week, because of that, what are the two um, identifiers of being a church? For the second week, what do we say is give, what do we say? Give generously, right? Give generously. And we explain that in deep. Why give? Why, why are we giving? Because we're in the image of God. God is a life giver. God is a giver. We need to be able to imitate Him because that's the whole point of Christianity. Because what did we say? Giving plucks out the sin of greed. Generous, generosity teaches us that all possessions, talents, whatever that is given to us is to profit others. We explain that. And we say there are two kinds of generosities, right? Last week, self-seeking and sacrificial generosity. Self-seeking, you are the focus. Self-seeking, there is an ulterior motive. You want it to be shown. You want it to be seen. You want it to be talked about, whatever that you want it to you, what you, you do a good thing. That's self-seeking generosity. Self-seeking generosity is out of our abundance. Out of our abundance. And some people were uh, mentioning to me last, uh, throughout the week, like that really, like, really stinged them a little bit. Because people are giving, we are being giving, even in, in, in our service, in, in, in our YOTC and everything, right? That is from our abundance, right? When we gather closes to send Ethiopia and everywhere, what do we say? Yeah, right? That's not sacrificial generosity. Sacrificial generosity is if you have two clothes, giving one. Or you put all the nice clothes that you have and say like, oh, this is the, my favorite clothes, I'll give two of my favorite clothes. Whatever that is priority for you, giving that, that's a sacrificial generosity. For, uh, Self-seeking focuses on visibility in, in the goal. So we want something to happen by giving. Sacrificial generosity just focuses on giving. It doesn't matter where the money goes. I give believing on God. So we've seen that and we see two things. So how do we apply? How do we apply it in our life? The first thing is, it's not about your money. It's not about your talent. It's not about your possessions. Give yourself. Giving yourself. What does that mean? Sacrificing your desires. Why are we always like mostly, especially the youth, we struggle? Because it's not because that we're bad people. It's not because that we're, we're accursed or anything like that. It's like we're a little bit selfish. We're not able to be selfless and give up. Give up of our desires. Give up the desires of lustful thinkings. Give up the desires of greed. Give up the desire of pride. I'm not going to forgive. That's a self selfless generosity. And after, if you give up all these things, for God, you're giving yourself to God. If you do that, the money is His. Your possession is His. Right? And we've seen that. Now, today, the final topic. Last week is give generously. The last one is gather genuinely. If you could pull it up there. Is that there? Gather genuinely. It's so interesting and unfortunate that our world, especially where we live right now, we're bombarded every single time about individualism. Just do you. Just only you. I need to be, uh, like, for myself. 
I need to take time for myself. I need to focus on myself. The self-care. Remember we talked about self-care? Self-care is not what we think of, what the world tells us. Disregarding everyone. Focusing on ourselves. Even spirituality. Even spirituality. I'm just going to, I'm going to do me. I'm going to come to church. I'm going to, I don't care. The other people, they let them deal their own thing. Individuality. The goal of the church is to be a gathering place. The goal of the church is a gathering place. So what it means is the church is a huge proponent, a huge supporter of gathering. And this is very evident even in our culture, if you go back to Ethiopia, even like other cultures too. Right? When you get married, when you gather people, where do you come? To church. When you have Mahavar a gathering, where is the Mahavar in Ethiopia? Where is it happening? The gathering of the you know people? In a church. Where is a burial or funeral? In a church. Baptism. Wherever the, there is any gathering, majority of the gatherings is related to the church. Church always promotes of gathering. If the church, the building, because we say that's a manifestation of us, right? Proponent of gathering, we need to be able to do that. We need to be able to imitate that. We need to be a champion of gathering. And for that, our lead verse today is Hebrews chapter 10. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much more, so much the more as you see the day approaching. I want to focus on two of the, the phrases here. If you read the first line, it talks about you do love, you love people, you, you, you love others, which is good. You do good works, which is good. Do not forsake of gathering. See? But in individualism taught, as long as you do good work, as long as you love somebody, you're a righteous person, why I need to deal with people? Why I need to go gathering? It's always like a drama. Why am I going? A lot of people say that. St. Paul talks of, do not forsake an assembling of ourselves. And finally, he says what? So much more when the time is getting closer. Isn't the time getting closer? That's what we always say. The kingdom of God is near. Come and repent. So much more. When the time is near, you know what is happening right now in the world. You know, like everywhere, the mainstream media, like everything. We were talking with some of our brothers yesterday, and like it's bluntly professing, boldly speaking of worshiping the devil in the songs of the songs that we hear, right? The famous singers that we acclaim and we say, like, Ooh, we love them, they bluntly say, if you listen to my song, you go to hell. And we still listen to them. That is the world that we're living in. Right? So this, this so much this time is the time we, sh- we need to assemble more. We need to get closer more. But what kind of gathering is St. Paul talking about? Because there is a different kind of gathering. For example, if you remember in the beginning of the gospel, when the three wise men came and they were looking for Christ and they asked Herod, Herod that we're looking for the king and he was confused and then after they, le- they left, what did he do? He gathered the wise men, their wise men at that time so that they could tell him where, right? So there's gathering, there are multiple gathering. The Pharisees gathered to crucify Christ. There's a lot of gathering. So what kind of gathering are we talking about? The gathering that we're talking about is gathering in His name out of our own will, our own intentionally, 
to benefit others. To benefit others and ourselves. To benefit others and ourselves. We put this intentionally. But the world tells us it benefits us. And if we have time, if we have extra things, we'll share for others. To benefit others. Priority to benefit others. We'll explain this in a little bit deeper uh, understanding. There's a verse in Matthew chapter 18. It says, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Right? When they are gathered, in my name. So the gathering has to be in his name. What do I mean by that? Some people regard gathering in his name is only gathering in the church. That's the main one, but I'm not only talking about that. You can have a cookout. You could have a gathering in the house, a fun time. I remember a long time ago, we had a hiking gathering to do a hiking. It was a fun time. But we started with a prayer and then did what we need to do. Even if whatever gathering do we have, if you call upon his name, he's in the midst of you, right? Because after that, do. If you have, it's enjoying time, if it's a prayer time, if it is reading the Bible, study time, whatever the case may be, calling upon his name. The gathering in his name is the gathering that we're talking about. The gathering is his name is you, that means you are the church. Why? A church is a dwelling place of God, right? We know that this is a dwelling place of God. God rests here. The Ark of the Covenant is the throne of God, right? That's what makes the ch a church a church. Because who dwells in it? When we gather genuinely, we become the dwelling place of God. When you gather genuinely, genuinely, we become the dwelling place of God. Right? That's what we say. If you gather in my name, I'll be there. Which means He dwells in us. So if He dwells in us, in turn, what do we become? A church. See? So that's why it's very important in gathering. There is so much places that, um, I will probably mention it later, but before I forget, I want to mention one of the verse Christ said for Jerusalem. Uh, I think it's letter, but I want to mention it. Uh, there's so much places that Christ, like, so much eagerly wants to gather people. And in one place, it says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How so much I want to gather you, to gather your people. As a hen, hen, a chicken, a hen, would gather her chicks, her children. I so much wanted to gather you guys. Christ was so broken when he was talking about this. And later on in the Gospel of John, he said, when I am lifted from earth, when I'm lifted above earth, I will gather everyone. So Christ, what do he mean by when I'm uplifted to earth? What does he mean by? On the cross. On the cross. So he's saying, my ultimate sacrifice on the cross is to gather everyone to me. So how much, so much more God wants gathering that we need to do gathering. Okay, having said that, okay, we know what did you, like the definition of it, but in a practical sense, in a practical sense, how does it look like in our life? The first and the main, of course, the gathering is the communal gathering. Communal gathering, which is the liturgy. I am so proud of everyone who came to the Divine Liturgy, even if you came late uh, for some cases, but I highly recommend to come a little bit early to participate in the Divine Liturgy. That is the utmost, the pinnacle of sacrifice, the pinnacle of prayer, the pinnacle of gathering. Right? So the power of a communal prayer. So if you are a church, you need to be able to believe and, you know, promote gathering. If you do that, what, what does it mean? That means you're a church who believes and focuses on the power of communal prayer. 
The word communal means a group of people living together and sharing possessions and responsibilities together. That's what it means. Did I put the definition there? No. All right. So that is what it means. A group of people living together and sharing possessions and responsibilities. That's uh, the literal definition. So we're saying the Divine Liturgy is the ultimate communal prayer. Why? Why? Do you remember earlier I was defying, I was uh, given a definition of genuine gathering. We say gathering in His name out of our own free will intentionally to benefit others and ourselves. How many of you guys were in uh, liturgy today? How many of you are in around the beginning of liturgy? Where's uh, the deacon? And I wanted one deacon. No, Burris, that's fine. He, uh, I thought I'm, okay. Um, so, have you guys remember when he says it's Alu? The first, the first is Alu, not just only it's Alu. When he says it's Alu, Banta Do you remember? He said that. What does it mean? Pray for those who brought an offering to the church. What is our response? I want you to focus on the meanings. What is our response? Accept the prayer of me. Is that what it says? Accept the prayer of our brothers. Accept the prayer of our sisters. And later on, after that, accept our prayer. That's the true spiritual path. One of the uh, Abba Moses, may his blessing be with us, said, when the bunch of grapes has been separated from the vine, it is gathered together in one piece. In the same way, you must remain with your brothers and not separated from them. And later on, Abunant, Abba Anthony, the great, he said, our life and our death is with our neighbor. As a Christian, first we pray others. And there's another one, I didn't put it here. It says, uh, when you stand in prayer, from the first time, when you stand in prayer, if you pray for your brother, your sister, who offended you, who insulted you, uh, everybody, if you pray, it says, you don't even have to pray for yourself. God surely listened to your prayer and he, even before saying it, He knows your heart and He will fulfill it for you. He will fulfill it for you. That's for sure. That is the path of orthodoxy. So that's why we say it in the Divine Liturgy. We pray for our brothers and our sisters and then are for us. Communal worship is not customary. For a lot of places, it's customary. It's a tradition to come. But it's a necessary. It's necessary. The other reason why it's necessary is, it's the opportunity you experience Christ. It's the opportunity you experience Christ. What do I mean by that? Of course, the flesh and blood Christ, but I'm not talking about that. I'm going to give you an ex exercise. All right, I'm gonna, we're going to do an exercise. It's a little bit different, so bear with me. And don't say any, um, I'm changing stuff, but focus. And let's, 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 because uh, I wanted to make this point. All right, you want to do the exercise with me? Cool? Close your eyes. So, each and every one of us in our life, Christ have done so many things in our life. Not only that, every stretch of his whip, 
his scar, he, through that, he erased our sins. Every sin that you think of, that he, you did, through his suffering, he erased it. He loved you dearly, unconditionally. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter who you are. Now, let's say Christ is coming, literally, and he's sitting next to you. He just sat next to you. Based on all this, what is the first thing that you want to do? You can open your eyes now. What, do you, what, what is the first thing that you want to do? What, what do you want to do? Right? 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 Hug him. Kiss him. Tell him like how so appreciative you are. Right? The person next to you is Christ. She is Christ. He is Christ. The person next to you is Christ. The person next to you is Christ. Everyone individually that's sitting next to you is Christ. You want to do what you are intended to, to, to show Christ? Show that to your brother next to you. We, ex we say like we love God, Christ, and the that is next to you. That's what Abantani said. Our life and our death are with our neighbor. If I gain, if we gain our brother, we have gained God. But if we scandalize our neighbor, we have sinned against Christ. You have sinned against Christ. When we're coming to church, when you're gathering, there is this picture that I, 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 I don't know if it's in the next uh, slide. Can you put it in the next slide? Yes. Does anybody experience this in Ethiopia? That's one of my favorite experiences. In Tensai, in, in, in Easter, everyone has like the, the tall candle, Ethiopian candle, twaf. Right? Every one of us. And we chant and everything. But my, my great experience is not that. That's, that's another level. My other great experience is when we leave from the church after everything is done. What's going to happen? Everyone is... We hold that off until we get to our house. Everyone. I used to go to uh, Selassie Church in, a, in a, the big church cathedral. So when we go to, to go to our house... Everyone has the tuaf, the tuaf, the tuaf. But there is this thing. As soon as when you go out to church, there's a whole bunch of tuaf. The light, like even the darkness is kind of a little bit lighter. But then when you go, when you go, what's going to happen? Some people would go to their house and the tuaf or the light is reducing. Go, go. Finally, when you go around your 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 you know, your, house, your walkway in your house, it's going to be one, one candle, right? That light is the resemblance of Christ. When we are gathered, all this individually, if you guys are like the candle, you're lighting the place. Christ through you is lighting the place. Being individual is just like one matchstick, just one candle. See how it's so important in the gathering? The other thing is, through gathering, and people like take it lightly and like, I feel sorry for this, but your prayers may be answered by one genuine, pure, meek person that is in this house when we're doing a prayer. That's the level of faith that you have to have. If you're following Christ, that's the level of... Because, of course, it's biblical. We, we will attest to that. So when we stand in, in the divine liturgy, right? I pray my God like to, to do something for me in my life or to give some, whatever the case may be. God may fulfill that, but not because maybe not of me, because I, my heart is not there with God. But there may be somebody 
from you, amongst you, who's truly humble, who's truly his heart is connected. And for that, for the sake of that person, God may bless me. Not only me, God may bless every one of us. And this is biblical. You don't remember the, the story of uh, Abraham in Genesis chapter 18? You don't remember that story? What happened? The Sodom and Gomorrah story. Abraham was standing in front of God. Standing means pleading, means interceding. He was standing in front of God, praying for the Sodom and Gomorrah people. But what did he say? God, please. Not so much many people. They're going to be, you know, in vain. What if there are 50 people? If there are 50 people, would you going to forgive everyone? And God said, absolutely, I'll forgive everyone. For the sake of 50 people, he was going to forgive the whole city. And Abraham, he was like, he's for sure that might not be the exact number. They're not going to be 50 people of righteous people. Okay, what about 40? Okay, I'll forgive 40 people if there are 40 righteous people. He said, okay, what about 20? What about 30? 20. And he went down until to what? 10 people. If there's 10 righteous people, God, please forgive them. And he says, absolutely, I will forgive if there are 10 people that are connected to the heart to, to me. The story is telling us that God will forgive multitude because of one person. Absolutely, he will, do, he will do that. Before I continue to the, my next topic, this is one of my favorite stories, so I will, I will, I'll tell you guys, some of you would know it, but this also tells you the power of communal worship, but also the power of a personal uh, strength in spirituality. You remember the story of uh, Simon the Shoemaker? Simon the Shoemaker, it's in uh, one of the Desert Father stories. And... Uh, the story goes, there is um, a, a cruel king at that time, and they ha he has some people who also conspired against the Christians and told the, the king, saying that, oh, the Christians believe that uh, what Christ mentioned. They, they believe that if you have faith, you can say this mountain to go up, and then it would go up. They believe in that. So they, why, don't, why don't you test them if that's true? Because they say they, they claim that it's a true faith. And the king goes like, yeah, if they say that, like, show us. And he called the bishop and said, do you believe in this? Yes, we believe in that. Okay. Show, show, why don't you show us? You guys said you have faith in Christ. You have faith in God. Why don't you show us? And the bishop said, give me three days. And he would go and he would start pleading and praying, pleading and praying to God. And God revealed to him. And he said, I heard your prayer. But, and I will do what is, what, is, what is required, but not because of you. There is a certain person amongst your, your, your village who's so spiritual that he's connected and he talks to the angels. Call him, and when you guys pray together, I will do that. And he would go, and the person is who? Simon the shoemaker. He would find him in the, in the marketplace. And if you see him, like he's not, he's, he looks a beggar. He was just making a shoe. And he said, God called me. And he said, no, and I don't have any, any, any gift. But he insisted. When he insisted, what is John, uh, Simon the shoemaker said? He told him, okay. After two days or three days, I don't remember the, the exact date, but gather all the people. Gather all the people. And we'll all stand and do Kirere some prayer. And we'll see what God does. And he said, the bishop, you'll be in the front. But you're not going to see me. I'll be in the middle of somewhere and then we'll do the prayer. So it gathered everyone. He, uh, the bishop gathered everyone and in front of the, actually they have a monastery now in, uh, I think in uh, Alexandria in Egypt uh, of this story they would gather everyone, they stand and they start praying they start praying 
Here, you see the, the prayer or the humbleness of the Simon Shoemaker and he doesn't want any attention. But not only that. But not only that. Of course, that's the main reason that that miracle happened. But he also a proponent of a communal worship. He could have said, oh, let's go, let's show them. No. It needed all the community to pray together. Right? So communal worship is so much important for uh, for orthodoxy to beat a church what is the other part of communal worship communal i mean um, genuine gathering the genuine gathering is gathering in one spirit as one body one spirit as one body or we can call it one accord one accord is the reflection of a genuine gathering We need to be able to concern, get concerned if a person being absent from, from the multitude. One person being absent affects the fullness of the body of Christ. But for, for some of us, as I said, because individualism, we don't care. He came, he came, he go, she came, she go. It needs to concern us. We need to inquire about that person. Why he's not coming? Is he okay? Even if he doesn't want to come, praying for the person. Because that's the body. If he doesn't come, the fullness of the body of Christ is not full. That's the mentality that we need to have. One person being absent affects the fullness of Christ's body. One weak person is yet the part of the fullness of Christ's body. One weak person. One weak person. I feel like in the church, like every, one weak person who cannot be able to come or came in probably disappeared. That weak person, there is this verse, I think I probably brought it there. It's long, but I want you like really to read it. It's um, um, First Corinthians. He talks about the body. St. Paul, he says, The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor gain the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the part of the body, this is what I want to focus, the part of the body that seems to be weaker are indispensable. Did you get it? So, I have a body, right? What part of my body is fully, I wanted to fully protect it, to cover it? The weak part. The weak part of the body. The strongest part. But the weak part, we cover it, we protect it. The weak part of the body is your brother and sister who, think, who you think he's weak. If you think he's weak, that's where actually you most... You need to protect him, to encourage him, to God, because that's needed. That's, if he's not there, the fullness of the body of Christ is not full. The body that seems to be weaker are in this one. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the great honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with great modesty, which are mo more presentable parts we do, we do not require or presentable parts who's stronger we don't require but God has so composed the body giving great honor to the part that lack it that means the weak, weaker of our brothers and sisters whether your brother your sister is weak he or she is the body of Christ if he's strong or she's strong, she's the body of Christ. So because of that, when we're gathering in one, we make the fullness of the body of Christ. The fullness body of Christ. Lastly, last point. Why the need of gathering? The last point is because gathering will sharpen us to be spiritually progressing. Some people avoid gathering, saying that 
it's, there's a lot of drama and it derails my spiritual life so I don't want to associate in any gathering and I'll just, you know, just, just do my own thing. Okay. Even the people ask me advice, if it is for a certain time, just to gather their spiritual energy or weapon in a way, I would say, okay, that's good. Let's say I can't gather with a lot of people because I, they test my patience. I don't have patience for people. So I don't want to gather, I want to be by myself. Okay, work on yourself to be more patient and they would work on themselves. How are they going to test it? They need to get back into their brothers and sisters. Test, be tested of your patience. Be tested of being forgiving, the resentment, all of those, you know, snares or like the bad things that we have, you need a gathering. There is no better, like really helpful uh, place than a gathering, especially even in the spiritual gathering that tests us so that we could grow spiritually. So having said that, my path of salvation is directly connected to my brother. There is no individualism in the spiritual life. My path of salvation is directly connected to my brother. Spiritual gatherings is where we test our progress in patience, obedience, calmness, com being compassionate, and all of those things, right? All right, having said that, I'm going to give you four or five tips of what we need to do, and we can co conclude today. First thing, what do I do? Attend communal worship service consistently. I know it's a struggle. I know it's tiring. There is a most fight. But you are a church. You claim to be a church. One thing I wanted to mention earlier, I forgot. You know what partaking communion means? Of course, the, we, we partake of flesh and blood of Christ. But it has another, another deeper meaning of partaking communion. Partaking communion is like it's not like a signature. For example, you want to buy a house or you want to buy a car. You, what would you do? You go to like a lender or something and you say, oh, I attest that I would pay monthly, that I have insurance, that I would fulfill this, that I would do this. And then finally, we sign. Partaking communion is a signature of what we have been said earlier. For example, tawakaf, right? We say, accept our brothers, greet our, our brothers, forgive our brothers. You do that? Yes. And you, we will say what? I confirm and I attest in my signature by partaking. But I made a covenant with God that I'll forgive my brother, that I'll think of my brother, my sister. That's, that's one of the, the deeper meanings of partaking communion. You're signing a signature. So let's see. Attending communal worship service is consistently is needed too. Regularly and consistently partaking, partaking the body and the blood of Christ. Yeah, there is, we explained that like the past however many years. Third, prayer services, attending prayer services. When there are multiple prayer services, even in, in YOTC, brothers and sisters attend prayer services. That's a communal gathering. Fourth, create life groups as a, or make a life group priority and attend this. I, I really like, I am proud of especially the past, uh, the Life of St. Paul class that we did. There was a life group and there was, it's not only one life group. There are so multiple life groups, I don't even, some of them I didn't know that there existed. And people are like spiritually progressing, which is amazing. Life group means you will gather, you know, you'll have a refreshment and everything, but you'll talk about spiritual things, especially what we learned in class. Discuss how it would relate to spiritual life, all of those things. Make life group a priority and attend those. Finally, attend fellowship and social activities with members of the body. With members of the body. I would say 60% of people falling into sin it's not because of their own initiative 
is from people around us. And sometimes we feel like, yeah, I want to have fun, but, you know, there is the engraved wrong mentality that church is not fun or the church group of people are not fun. We need to correct that. I told you earlier, we went to the hiking, which had an amazing time. We, go, we do cookouts and everything, right? Through that gathering, it's also in the name of Christ, but it's a gathering, we'll have fun. Participate on those things. Instead of only looking for people to have that kind of fun or joy that would take you away from the path of God. Right? If you do continually do this, that means you are the church of Christ, you are the house of the dwelling place of God, and you're gathering genuinely. We'll conclude this. The point of this series is we would love for you guys to come to church and part everything, right? But we would be so fulfilled in joy if we do what you do here today or on Sundays or Saturday nights to do that also outside on Mondays, on Tuesdays, Wednesdays. How you are very reserved, you know, humble, obedient when you're in church. We want that in other places because you're representing the church, the church of Christ. Right? So I hope and pray that these three parts, to gather genuinely, to give generously, and also the first week what we've seen of what it means to be church, really give you some insight of that you are a dwelling place of God. Not only coming to church on Sunday morning is not enough. Apply that in day-to-day -day life, and I hope and pray that God give you the discernment and the energy and the strength to do that. Glory be to God.